Hinduism is an Indian religion and dharma, or a way of life, widely practiced in the Indian subcontinent and parts of Southeast Asia. Hinduism has been called the oldest religion in the world, and some practitioners and scholars refer to it as Sanatana Dharma, the eternal tradition, or the eternal way, beyond human history. Scholars regard Hinduism as a fusion or synthesis of various Indian cultures and traditions, with diverse roots and no founder. This Hindu synthesis started to develop between 500 BCE and 300 CE, after the end of the Vedic period 1500 BCE to 500 BCE, and flourished in the medieval period, with the decline of Buddhism in India. Although Hinduism contains a broad range of philosophies, it is linked by shared concepts, recognizable rituals, cosmology, shared textual resources, and pilgrimage to sacred sites. Hindu texts are classified into sruti, heard, and smirti, remembered. These texts discuss theology, philosophy, mythology, Vedic yajna, yoga, agamic rituals, and temple building, among other topics. Major scriptures include the Vedas and Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Agamas. Sources of authority and eternal truths in its texts play an important role, but there is also a strong Hindu tradition of questioning authority in order to deepen the understanding of these truths and to further develop the tradition. Prominent themes in Hindu beliefs include the four purasarthas, the proper goals or aims of human life, namely dharma ethics, duties, artha prosperity, work, kama desires, passions, and moksha liberation, freedom from the cycle of death and rebirth, salvation, karma action, intent and consequences, samsara cycle of death and rebirth, and the various yogas paths or practices to attain moksha. Hindu practices include rituals such as puja worship and recitations, japa, meditation, family-oriented rites of passage, annual festivals, and occasional pilgrimages. Some Hindus leave their social world and material possessions, then engage in lifelong sannyasa monastic practices to achieve moksha. Hinduism prescribes the eternal duties, such as honesty, refraining from injuring living beings ahimsa, patience, forbearance, self-restraint, and compassion, among others. The four largest denominations of Hinduism are the Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktism and Smartism. Hinduism is the world's third largest religion. Its followers, known as Hindus, constitute about 1.15 billion, or 15-16% of the global population. Hindus form the majority of the population in India, Nepal and Mauritius. Significant Hindu communities are also found in the Caribbean, Africa, North America, and other countries. Etymology <inaudible> The word Hindu is derived from Indo-Aryan, Sanskrit root Sindhu. The Proto-Iranian sound change asterisk s greater than h occurred between 850 to 600 BCE, according to Asko Parpola. It is believed that Hindu was used as the name for the Indus River in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent, modern-day Pakistan and northern India. According to Gavin Flood, the actual term Hindu first occurs as a Persian geographical term for the people who lived beyond the river Indus, Sanskrit Sindhu. More specifically in the 6th century BCE inscription of Darius I BCE. The term Hindu in these ancient records is a geographical term and did not refer to a religion. Among the earliest known records of Hindu with connotations of religion may be in the 7th century CE Chinese text record of the western regions by Zanzong, and 14th century Persian text Futuhu's Salatin by Abd al-Malik Asami. Thapar states that the word Hindu is found as Heptahindu in Avesta, equivalent to Rigvedic Sapta Sindhu, while Hndstn pronounced Hindustan is found in a Sasanian inscription from the 3rd century CE, both of which refer to parts of northwestern South Asia. The Arabic term Al-Hind referred to the people who live across the river Indus. This Arabic term was itself taken from the pre-Islamic Persian term Hindu, which refers to all Indians. By the 13th century, Hindustan emerged as a popular alternative name of India, meaning the land of Hindus. The term Hindu was later used occasionally in some Sanskrit texts such as the later Rajataranginis of Kashmir Hinduka, c. 1450, and some 16th to 18th century Bengali Gaudiya Vaishnava texts including Chaitanya Charitamrita and Chaitanya Bhagavata. These texts used it to distinguish Hindus from Muslims who are called Yavanas foreigners or Malechas barbarians, with the 16th century Chaitanya Charitamrita text and the 17th century Bhakta Mala text using the phrase, 
Hindu Dharma. It was only towards the end of the 18th century that European merchants and colonists began to refer to the followers of Indian religions collectively as Hindus. The term Hinduism, then spelled Hinduism, was introduced into the English language in the 18th century to denote the religious, philosophical, and cultural traditions native to India. Definitions <inaudible> 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 Hinduism includes a diversity of ideas on spirituality and traditions, but has no ecclesiastical order, no unquestionable religious authorities, no governing body, no prophets, nor any binding holy book. Hindus can choose to be polytheistic, pantheistic, monotheistic, monistic, agnostic, atheistic, or humanist. Because of the wide range of traditions and ideas covered by the term Hinduism, arriving at a comprehensive definition is difficult. The religion defies our desire to define and categorize it." Hinduism has been variously defined as a religion, a religious tradition, a set of religious beliefs, and a way of life. From a Western lexical standpoint, Hinduism like other faiths is appropriately referred to as a religion. In India the term Dharma is preferred, which is broader than the Western term religion. The study of India and its cultures and religions, and the definition of Hinduism has been shaped by the interests of colonialism and by Western notions of religion. Since the 1990s, those influences and its outcomes have been the topic of debate among scholars of Hinduism, and have also been taken over by critics of the Western view on India. Topic. Typology Hinduism as it is commonly known can be subdivided into a number of major currents. Of the historical division into six darsanas philosophies, two schools, Vedanta and Yoga, are currently the most prominent. Classified by primary deity or deities, four major Hinduism modern currents are Vaishnavism Vishnu, Shaivism Shiva, Shaktism Devi, and Smartism five deities treated as same. Hinduism also accepts numerous divine beings, with many Hindus considering the deities to be aspects or manifestations of a single impersonal absolute or ultimate reality or God, while some Hindus maintain that a specific deity represents the supreme and various deities are lower manifestations of this supreme. Other notable characteristics include a belief in existence of Atman soul, self, reincarnation of one's Atman, and karma as well as a belief in dharma duties, rights, laws, conduct, virtues and right way of living. McDaniel 2007 classifies Hinduism into six major kinds and numerous minor kinds, in order to understand expression of emotions among the Hindus. The major kinds, according to McDaniel are, folk Hinduism, based on local traditions and cults of local deities and is the oldest, non-literate system, Vedic Hinduism based on the earliest layers of the Vedas traceable to 2nd millennium BCE, Vedantic Hinduism based on the philosophy of the Upanishads, including Advaita Vedanta, emphasizing knowledge and wisdom, Yogic Hinduism, following the text of Yoga Sutras of Patanjali emphasizing introspective awareness, Dharmic Hinduism or, daily morality which McDaniel states is stereotyped in some books as the only form of Hindu religion with a belief in karma, cows and caste, and bhakti or devotional Hinduism, where intense emotions are elaborately incorporated in the pursuit of the spiritual. Michaels distinguishes three Hindu religions and four forms of Hindu religiosity. The three Hindu religions are Brahmanic Sanskritic Hinduism, folk religions and tribal religions, and founded religions. The four forms of Hindu religiosity are the classical karma marga, jnana marga, bhakti marga, and heroism, which is rooted in militaristic traditions, such as Ramaism and parts of political Hinduism. This is also called Virya marga. According to Michaels, one out of nine Hindu belongs by birth to one or both of the Brahmanic Sanskritic Hinduism and folk religion typology, whether practicing or non practicing. He classifies most Hindus as belonging by choice to one of the founded religions, such as Vaishnavism and Shaivism that are salvation-focused and often de-emphasize Brahman priestly authority yet incorporate ritual grammar of Brahmanic Sanskritic Hinduism. He includes among founded religions, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism that are now distinct religions, syncretic movements such as Brahmo Samaj and the Theosophical Society, as well as various 
Guru isms and new religious movements such as Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and Iskan. Inden states that the attempt to classify Hinduism by typology started in the imperial times, when proselytizing missionaries and colonial officials sought to understand and portray Hinduism from their interests. Hinduism was construed as emanating not from a reason of spirit but fantasy and creative imagination, not conceptual but symbolical, not ethical but emotive, not rational or spiritual but of cognitive mysticism. This stereotype followed and fit, states Inden, with the imperial imperatives of the era, providing the moral justification for the colonial project. From tribal animism to Buddhism, everything was subsumed as part of Hinduism. The early reports set the tradition and scholarly premises for typology of Hinduism, as well as the major assumptions and flawed presuppositions that has been at the foundation of Indology. Hinduism, according to Inden, has been neither what imperial religionists stereotyped it to be, nor is it appropriate to equate Hinduism to be merely monist pantheism and philosophical idealism of Advaita Vedanta. Topic. Indigenous understanding Topic. Sanatana Dharma To its adherents, Hinduism is a traditional way of life. Many practitioners refer to the orthodox form of Hinduism as Sanatana Dharma, the eternal law, or the eternal way. The Sanskrit word Dharma has a much broader meaning than religion and is not its equivalent. All aspects of a Hindu life, namely acquiring wealth artha, fulfillment of desires kama, and attaining liberation moksha, are part of dharma which encapsulates the right way of living and eternal harmonious principles in their fulfillment. According to the editors of the Encyclopedia Britannica, Sanatana Dharma historically referred to the eternal duties religiously ordained in Hinduism, duties such as honesty, refraining from injuring living beings ahimsa, purity, goodwill, mercy, patience, forbearance, self-restraint, generosity, and asceticism. These duties applied regardless of a Hindu's class, caste, or sect, and they contrasted with svadharma, one's own duty, in accordance with one's class or caste varna and stage in life purisartha. In recent years, the term has been used by Hindu leaders, reformers, and nationalists to refer to Hinduism. Sanatana Dharma has become a synonym for the eternal truth and teachings of Hinduism, that transcend history and are unchanging, indivisible and ultimately nonsectarian. According to other scholars such as Kim Knott and Brian Hatcher, Sanatana Dharma refers to timeless, eternal set of truths. And this is how Hindus view the origins of their religion. It is viewed as thasi eternal truths and tradition with origins beyond human history, truths divinely revealed shruti in the Vedas, the most ancient of the world's scriptures. To many Hindus, the Western term, religion, to the extent it means, dogma and an institution traceable to a single founder, is inappropriate for their tradition, states Hatcher. Hinduism, to them, is a tradition that can be traced at least to the ancient Vedic era. Topic. Vedika Dharma Some have referred to Hinduism as the Vedika Dharma. The word Vedika in Sanskrit means derived from or conformable to the Veda or relating to the Veda. Traditional scholars employed the terms Vedika and Avedika, those who accept the Vedas as a source of authoritative knowledge and those who don't, to differentiate various Indian schools from Jainism, Buddhism and Charvaka. According to Klaus Klostermeyer, the term Vedika Dharma is the earliest self-designation of Hinduism. According to Arvind Sharma, the historical evidence suggests that the Hindus were referring to their religion by the term Vedika Dharma or a variant thereof by the 4th century CE. According to Brian K. Smith, it is debatable at the very least as to whether the term Vedika Dharma cannot, with the proper concessions to historical, cultural and ideological specificity, be comparable to and translated as Hinduism or Hindu religion. According to Alexis Sanderson, the early Sanskrit texts differentiate between Vedika, Vaishnava, Shaiva, Shakta, Sora, Buddhist and Jaina traditions. However, the late first millennium CE Indic consensus had indeed come to conceptualize a complex entity corresponding to Hinduism as opposed to Buddhism and Jainism excluding only certain forms of antinomian Shakta Shaiva." From its fold. Some in the Mimamsa school of Hindu philosophy considered the Agamas such as the Pankaratrika to be invalid because it did not conform to the Vedas. 
Some Kashmiri scholars rejected the esoteric tantric traditions to be a part of Vedika Dharma. The Atimarga Shaivism ascetic tradition, datable to about 500 CE, challenged the Vedika frame and insisted that their agamas and practices were not only valid, they were superior than those of the Vedikas. However, Ad Sanderson, this Shaiva ascetic tradition viewed themselves as being genuinely true to the Vedic tradition and held unanimously that the sruti and smriti of Brahmanism are universally and uniquely valid in their own sphere and that as such they Vedas are man's sole means of valid knowledge." The term Vedika Dharma means a code of practice that is "...based on the Vedas," but it is unclear what "...based on the Vedas," really implies, states Julius Lipner. The Vedika Dharma or "...Vedic way of life," states Lipner, does not mean "...Hinduism is necessarily religious," or that Hindus have a universally accepted "...conventional or institutional meaning." For that term. To many, it is as much a cultural term. Many Hindus do not have a copy of the Vedas nor have they ever seen or personally read parts of a Veda, like a Christian might relate to the Bible or a Muslim might to the Quran. Yet, states Lipner, this does not mean that their Hindus whole life's orientation cannot be traced to the Vedas or that it does not in some way derive from it. Many religious Hindus implicitly acknowledge the authority of the Vedas, this acknowledgement is often no more than a declaration that someone considers himself or herself a Hindu. Some Hindus challenge the authority of the Vedas, thereby implicitly acknowledging its importance to the history of Hinduism, states Lipner. Topic: <inaudible> Hindu Modernism. Beginning in the 19th century, Indian modernists reasserted Hinduism as a major asset of Indian civilization, meanwhile, purifying Hinduism from its tantric elements and elevating the Vedic elements. Western stereotypes were reversed, emphasizing the universal aspects, and introducing modern approaches of social problems. This approach had a great appeal, not only in India, but also in the West. Major representatives of Hindu modernism are Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Vivekananda, Sarvpali Radhakrishnan and Mahatma Gandhi. Raja Ram Mohan Roy is known as the father of the Hindu Renaissance. He was a major influence on Swami Vivekananda who, according to Flood, was "...a figure of great importance in the development of a modern Hindu self-understanding and in formulating the West's view of Hinduism." Central to his philosophy is the idea that the divine exists in all beings, that all human beings can achieve union with this "...innate divinity," and that seeing this divine as the essence of others will further love and social harmony. According to Vivekananda, there is an essential unity to Hinduism, which underlies the diversity of its many forms. According to Flood, Vivekananda's vision of Hinduism is one generally accepted by most English-speaking middle-class Hindus today. Sarvpali Radhakrishnan sought to reconcile Western rationalism with Hinduism, presenting Hinduism as an essentially rationalistic and humanistic religious experience. This global Hinduism has a worldwide appeal, transcending national boundaries and, according to Flood, "...becoming a world religion alongside Christianity, Islam and Buddhism," both for the Hindu diaspora communities and for Westerners who are attracted to non-Western cultures and religions. It emphasizes universal spiritual values such as social justice, peace and "...the spiritual transformation of humanity." It has developed partly due to re or the pizza effect, in which elements of Hindu culture have been exported to the West, gaining popularity there, and as a consequence also gained greater popularity in India. This globalization of Hindu culture brought to the West teachings which have become an important cultural force in Western societies, and which in turn have become an important cultural force in India, their place of origin. <laughs> Western understanding. The term Hinduism is coined in Western ethnography in the 18th century, and refers to the fusion or synthesis of various Indian cultures and traditions, which emerged after the Vedic period, between 500 to 200 BCE and c. 300 CE, the beginning of the epic and Puranic c. Q. Preclassical 
Period, Hinduism's tolerance to variations in belief and its broad range of traditions make it difficult to define as a religion according to traditional Western conceptions. Some academics suggest that Hinduism can be seen as a category with fuzzy edges rather than as a well defined and rigid entity. Some forms of religious expression are central to Hinduism and others, while not as central, still remain within the category. Based on this idea Pharaoh Lutzi has developed a prototype theory approach to the definition of Hinduism. Topic. Diversity and unity Topic. Diversity Hinduism has been described as a tradition having a complex, organic, multi-leveled and sometimes internally inconsistent nature. Hinduism does not have a unified system of belief encoded in a declaration of faith or a creed, but is rather an umbrella term comprising the plurality of religious phenomena of India. According to the Supreme Court of India, unlike other religions in the world, the Hindu religion does not claim any one prophet, it does not worship any one god, it does not believe in any one philosophic concept, it does not follow any one act of religious rites or performances, in fact, it does not satisfy the traditional features of a religion or creed. It is a way of life and nothing more. Part of the problem with a single definition of the term Hinduism is the fact that Hinduism does not have a founder. It is a synthesis of various traditions, the Brahmanical orthopraxy, the renouncer traditions and popular or local traditions. Theism is also difficult to use as a unifying doctrine for Hinduism, because while some Hindu philosophies postulate a theistic ontology of creation, other Hindus are or have been atheists. Topic. Sense of unity Despite the differences, there is also a sense of unity. Most Hindu traditions revere a body of religious or sacred literature, the Vedas, although there are exceptions. These texts are a reminder of the ancient cultural heritage and point of pride for Hindus, with Louis Renu stating that, "...even in the most orthodox domains, the reverence to the Vedas has come to be a simple raising of the hat." Halbfast states that, although Shaivism and Vaishyism may be regarded as "...self-contained religious constellations," there is a degree of interaction and reference between the theoreticians and literary representatives of each tradition which indicates the presence of a wider sense of identity, a sense of coherence in a shared context and of inclusion in a common framework and horizon. Topic. Indigenous developments The notion of common denominators for several religions and traditions of India further developed from the 12th century CE on. Lorenzen traces the emergence of a family resemblance and what he calls as beginnings of medieval and modern Hinduism, taking shape, at c. 300 to 600 CE, with the development of the early Puranas, and continuities with the earlier Vedic religion. Lorenzen states that the establishment of a Hindu self identity took place through a process of mutual self definition with a contrasting Muslim other. According to Lorenzen, this presence of the other is necessary to recognize the loose family resemblance among the various traditions and schools according to the indologist alexis sanderson before islam arrived in india the sanskrit sources differentiated vedika vaisnava saiva sakta sora buddhist and jaina traditions but they had no name that denotes the first 5 of these as a collective entity over and against buddhism and jainism this absence of a formal name, states Sanderson, does not mean that the corresponding concept of Hinduism did not exist. By late 1st millennium CE, the concept of a belief and tradition distinct from Buddhism and Jainism had emerged. This complex tradition accepted in its identity almost all of what is currently Hinduism, except certain antinomian tantric movements. Some conservative thinkers of those times questioned whether certain Shaiva, Vaishnava and Shakta texts or practices were consistent with the Vedas, or were invalid in their entirety. Moderates then, and most orthoprax scholars later, agreed that though there are some variations, the foundation of their beliefs, the ritual grammar, the spiritual premises and the soteriologies were same. This sense of greater unity, states Sanderson, came to be called Hinduism. According to Nicholson, already between the 12th and the 16th centuries, 
Certain thinkers began to treat as a single whole the diverse philosophical teachings of the Upanishads, epics, Puranas, and the schools known retrospectively as the six systems of mainstream Hindu philosophy. The tendency of a blurring of philosophical distinctions has also been noted by Burley. Hacker called this inclusivism, and Michaels speaks of the identificatory habit. Lorenzen locates the origins of a distinct Hindu identity in the interaction between Muslims and Hindus, and a process of mutual self-definition with a contrasting Muslim other, which started well before 1800. Michaels notes, as a counteraction to Islamic supremacy and as part of the continuing process of regionalization, two religious innovations developed in the Hindu religions, the formation of sects and a historicization which preceded later nationalism. S. Aints and sometimes militant sect leaders, such as the Marathi poet Tukaram and Ramdas articulated ideas in which they glorified Hinduism and the past. The Brahmins also produced increasingly historical texts, especially eulogies and chronicles of sacred sites Mahatmayas, or developed a reflexive passion for collecting and compiling extensive collections of quotations on various subjects. This inclusivism was further developed in the 19th and 20th centuries by Hindu reform movements and Neo-Vedanta, and has become characteristic of modern Hinduism. Colonial influences. The notion and reports on Hinduism as a single world religious tradition was popularized by 19th century proselytizing missionaries and European Indologists, roles sometimes served by the same person, who relied on texts preserved by Brahmins priests for their information of Indian religions, and animist observations which the missionary Orientalists presumed was Hinduism. These reports influenced perceptions about Hinduism. Some scholars state that the colonial polemical reports led to fabricated stereotypes where Hinduism was mere mystic paganism devoted to the service of devils, while other scholars state that the colonial constructions influenced the belief that the Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, Manumriti and such texts were the essence of Hindu religiosity, and in the modern association of Hindu doctrine with the schools of Vedanta in particular Advaita Vedanta as paradigmatic example of Hinduism's mystical nature. Pennington, while concurring that the study of Hinduism as a world religion began in the colonial era, disagrees that Hinduism is a colonial European era invention. He states that the shared theology, common ritual grammar and way of life of those who identify themselves as Hindus is traceable to ancient times. <laughs> <laughs> Beliefs Prominent themes in Hindu beliefs include but are not restricted to dharma ethics duties samsara the continuing cycle of birth life death and rebirth karma action intent and consequences moksha liberation from samsara or liberation in this life and the various yogas paths or practices topic <laughs> purusharthas objectives of human life Classical Hindu thought accepts four proper goals or aims of human life, dharma, artha, kama and moksha. These are known as the purusarthas. <laughs> dharma righteousness, ethics. Dharma is considered the foremost goal of a human being in Hinduism. The concept dharma includes behaviors that are considered to be in accord with RTA, the order that makes life and universe possible, and includes duties, rights, laws, conduct, virtues and right way of living. Hindu dharma includes the religious duties, moral rights and duties of each individual, as well as behaviors that enable social order, right conduct, and those that are virtuous. Dharma, according to Van Butenen, is that which all existing beings must accept and respect to sustain harmony and order in the world. It is, states Van Butenen, the pursuit and execution of one's nature and true calling, thus playing one's role in cosmic concert. The Brihadaranyaka Upanishad states it as, Nothing is higher than Dharma. The weak overcomes the stronger by Dharma, as over a king. Truly that Dharma is the truth sadhya, therefore, when a man speaks the truth, they say, He speaks the Dharma. And if he speaks Dharma, they say, He speaks the truth. For both are one. 
In the Mahabharata, Krishna defines dharma as upholding both this worldly and other worldly affairs. MBH 12.110.11. The word sanatana means eternal, perennial, or forever. Thus, sanatana dharma signifies that it is the dharma that has neither beginning nor end. Topic: Artha, livelihood, wealth. Artha is objective and virtuous pursuit of wealth for livelihood, obligations and economic prosperity. It is inclusive of political life, diplomacy and material well-being. The Artha concept includes all means of life, activities and resources that enables one to be in a state one wants to be in, wealth, career and financial security. The proper pursuit of Artha is considered an important aim of human life in Hinduism. Kama sensual pleasure. Kama Sanskrit, Pali, Devanagari, Kama means desire, wish, passion, longing, pleasure of the senses, the aesthetic enjoyment of life, affection, or love, with or without sexual connotations. In Hinduism, Kama is considered an essential and healthy goal of human life when pursued without sacrificing Dharma, Artha and Moksha. Moksha liberation, freedom from samsara. Moksha (Sanskrit: moksha, moksha or mukti (Sanskrit: mukti) is the ultimate, most important goal in Hinduism. In one sense, moksha is a concept associated with liberation from sorrow, suffering, and samsara (birth-rebirth cycle). A release from this eschatological cycle in afterlife, particularly in theistic schools of Hinduism, is called moksha. In other schools of Hinduism, such as monistic, moksha is a goal achievable in current life, as a state of bliss through self-realization, of comprehending the nature of one's soul, of freedom and of realizing the whole universe as the self. <laughs> Karma and samsara Karma translates literally as action, work, or deed, and also refers to a Vedic theory of moral law of cause and effect. The theory is a combination of one, causality that may be ethical or non-ethical, two, ethicization, that is good or bad actions have consequences, and three, rebirth. Karma theory is interpreted as explaining the present circumstances of an individual with reference to his or her actions in past. These actions may be those in a person's current life, or, in some schools of Hinduism, possibly actions in their past lives. Furthermore, the consequences may result in current life, or a person's future lives. This cycle of birth, life, death and rebirth is called samsara. Liberation from samsara through moksha is believed to ensure lasting happiness and peace. Hindu scriptures teach that the future is both a function of current human effort derived from free will and past human actions that set the circumstances. <laughs> moksha The ultimate goal of life, referred to as moksha, nirvana or samadhi, is understood in several different ways, as the realization of one's union with God, as the realization of one's eternal relationship with God, realization of the unity of all existence, perfect unselfishness and knowledge of the self, as the attainment of perfect mental peace, and as detachment from worldly desires. Such realization liberates one from samsara, thereby ending the cycle of rebirth, sorrow and suffering. Due to belief in the indestructibility of the soul, death is deemed insignificant with respect to the cosmic self. The meaning of moksha differs among the various Hindu schools of thought. For example, Advaita Vedanta holds that after attaining moksha, a person knows their soul, self, and identifies it as one with Brahman and everyone in all respects. The followers of Dvaita dualistic schools, in moksha state, identify individual soul, self as distinct from Brahman but infinitesimally close, and after attaining moksha expect to spend eternity in a loka heaven. To theistic schools of Hinduism, moksha is liberation from samsara, while for other schools such as the monistic school, moksha is possible in current life and is a psychological concept. According to Deutsche, moksha is transcendental consciousness to the latter, the perfect state of being, of self-realization, of freedom and of realizing the whole universe as the self. 
Moksha in these schools of Hinduism, suggests Klaus Klostermeyer, implies a setting free of hitherto fettered faculties, a removing of obstacles to an unrestricted life, permitting a person to be more truly a person in the full sense. The concept presumes an unused human potential of creativity, compassion, and understanding which had been blocked and shut out. Moksha is more than liberation from life rebirth cycle of suffering samsara. Vedantic school separates this into two: Jivanmukti, liberation in this life, and Vidihamukti, liberation after death. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Concept of God. Hinduism is a diverse system of thought with beliefs spanning monotheism, polytheism, panentheism, pantheism, pandeism, monism, and atheism among others, and its concept of God is complex and depends upon each individual and the tradition and philosophy followed. It is sometimes referred to as henotheistic i.e., involving devotion to a single God while accepting the existence of others, but any such term is an overgeneralization. The Nasadiya Sukta creation hymn of the Rig Veda is one of the earliest texts which demonstrates a sense of metaphysical speculation about what created the universe, the concept of gods and the one, and whether even the one knows how the universe came into being. The Rig Veda praises various deities, none superior nor inferior, in a henotheistic manner. The hymns repeatedly refer to one truth and reality. The one truth a Vedic literature, in modern era scholarship, has been interpreted as monotheism, monism, as well as a deified hidden principles behind the great happenings and processes of nature. Hindus believe that all living creatures have a soul. This soul, the spirit or true self of every person, is called the Atman. The soul is believed to be eternal. According to the monistic, pantheistic, non-dualist theologies of Hinduism, such as Advaita Vedanta school, this Atman is indistinct from Brahman, the supreme spirit. The goal of life, according to the Advaita school, is to realize that one soul is identical to supreme soul, that the supreme soul is present in everything and everyone. All life is interconnected, and there is oneness in all life. Dualistic schools, see Dvaita and Bhakti, understand Brahman as a supreme being separate from individual souls. They worship the Supreme Being variously as Vishnu, Brahma, Shiva, or Shakti, depending upon the sect. God is called Ishvara, Bhagavan, Parameshwara, Deva, or Devi, and these terms have different meanings in different schools of Hinduism. Hindu texts accept a polytheistic framework, but this is generally conceptualized as the divine essence or luminosity that gives vitality and animation to the inanimate natural substances. There is a divine in everything human beings, animals, trees, and rivers. It is observable in offerings to rivers, trees, tools of one's work, animals and birds, rising sun, friends and guests, teachers and parents. It is the divine in these that makes each sacred and worthy of reverence. This seeing divinity in everything, state Buttimer and Wallen, makes the Vedic foundations of Hinduism quite distinct from animism. The animistic premise sees multiplicity, power differences and competition between man and man, man and animal, as well as man and nature. The Vedic view does not see this competition, rather sees a unifying divinity that connects everyone and everything. The Hindu scriptures refer to celestial entities called devas or devi in feminine form. Devata used synonymously for deva in Hindi, which may be translated into English as gods or heavenly beings. The devas are an integral part of Hindu culture and are depicted in art, architecture and through icons, and stories about them are related in the scriptures, particularly in Indian epic poetry and the Puranas. They are, however, often distinguished from Ishvara, a personal god, with many Hindus worshipping Ishvara in one of its particular manifestations as their Istadavada, or chosen ideal. The choice is a matter of individual preference, and of regional and family traditions. The multitude of devas are considered as manifestations of Brahman. The word avatar does not appear in the Vedic literature, but appears in verb forms in post Vedic literature, and is a noun particularly in the Puranic literature after the 6th century CE. Theologically, the reincarnation idea is most often associated with the avatars of Hindu god Vishnu, though the idea has been applied to other deities. Varying lists of avatars of Vishnu appear in Hindu scriptures, including the ten Dashavatara of the Garuda Purana and the twenty-two avatars in the Bhagavata Purana, though the latter adds that the incarnations of Vishnu are innumerable. The avatars of Vishnu are important in Vaishnavism theology. In the goddess-based Shaktism tradition of Hinduism, avatars of the Devi are found and all goddesses are considered to be different aspects of the same metaphysical Brahman and Shakti energy. 
While avatars of other deities such as Ganesha and Shiva are also mentioned in medieval Hindu texts, this is minor and occasional. Both theistic and atheistic ideas, for epistemological and metaphysical reasons, are profuse in different schools of Hinduism. The early Naya school of Hinduism, for example, was non theist, atheist, but later Naya school scholars argued that God exists and offered proofs using its theory of logic. Other schools disagreed with Naya scholars. Samkhya, Mimamsa and Karvaka schools of Hinduism, were non-theist, atheist, arguing that God was an unnecessary metaphysical assumption. Its Vaisheshika school started as another non-theistic tradition relying on naturalism and that all matter is eternal, but it later introduced the concept of a non-creator God. The Yoga school of Hinduism accepted the concept of a personal God and left it to the Hindu to define his or her God. Advaita Vedanta taught a monistic, abstract self and oneness in everything, with no room for gods or deity, a perspective that Mohanty calls, "...spiritual, not religious." Bhakti sub-schools of Vedanta taught a creator god that is distinct from each human being. According to Graham Schweig, Hinduism has the strongest presence of the divine feminine in world religion from ancient times to the present. The goddess is viewed as the heart of the most esoteric Saiva traditions. Topic. Authority Authority and eternal truths play an important role in Hinduism. Religious traditions and truths are believed to be contained in its sacred texts, which are accessed and taught by sages, gurus, saints or avatars. But there is also a strong tradition of the questioning of authority, internal debate and challenging of religious texts in Hinduism. The Hindus believe that this deepens the understanding of the eternal truths and further develops the tradition. Authority was mediated through an intellectual culture that tended to develop ideas collaboratively, and according to the shared logic of natural reason. Narratives in the Upanishads present characters questioning persons of authority. The Kena Upanishad repeatedly asks Kena, by what power something is the case. The Katha Upanishad and Bhagavad Gita present narratives where the student criticizes the teacher's inferior answers. In the Shiva Purana, Shiva questions Vishnu and Brahma. Doubt plays a repeated role in the Mahabharata. Jayadeva's Gita Govinda presents criticism via the character of Radha. Topic. Main traditions Hinduism has no central doctrinal authority and many practicing Hindus do not claim to belong to any particular denomination or tradition. Four major denominations are, however, used in scholarly studies, Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktism and Smartism. These denominations differ primarily in the central deity worship, the traditions and the soteriological outlook. The denominations of Hinduism, states Lipner, are unlike those found in major religions of the world, because Hindu denominations are fuzzy with individuals practicing more than one, and he suggests the term, Hindu polycentrism. Vaishnavism is the devotional religious tradition that worships Vishnu and his avatars, particularly Krishna and Rama. The adherents of this sect are generally non-ascetic, monastic, oriented towards community events and devotionalism practices inspired by intimate loving, joyous, playful," Krishna and other Vishnu avatars. These practices sometimes include community dancing, singing of kirtans and bhajans, with sound and music believed by some to have meditative and spiritual powers. Temple worship and festivals are typically elaborate in Vaishnavism. The Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana, along with Vishnu-oriented Puranas provide its theistic foundations. Philosophically, their beliefs are rooted in the dualism sub-schools of Vedantic Hinduism. Shaivism is the tradition that focuses on Shiva. Shaivas are more attracted to ascetic individualism, and it has several sub-schools. Their practices include bhakti-style devotionalism, yet their beliefs lean towards nondual, monistic schools of Hinduism such as Advaita and Yoga. Some Shaivas worship in temples, while others emphasize yoga, striving to be one with Shiva within. Avatars are uncommon, and some Shaivas visualize God as half male, half female, as a fusion of the male and female principles Shaivism is related to Shaktism, wherein Shakti is seen as spouse of Shiva. Community celebrations include festivals, and participation, with Vaishnavas, in pilgrimages such as the Kumbh Mela. 
Shaivism has been more commonly practiced in the Himalayan north from Kashmir to Nepal, and in South India, Shaktism focuses on goddess worship of Shakti or Devi as cosmic mother, and it is particularly common in northeastern and eastern states of India such as Assam and Bengal. Devi is depicted as in Gentler forms like Parvati, the consort of Shiva, or, as fierce warrior goddesses like Kali and Durga. Followers of Shaktism recognize Shakti as the power that underlies the male principle. Shaktism is also associated with Tantra practices. Community celebrations include festivals, some of which include processions and idol immersion into a sea or other water bodies. Smartism centers its worship simultaneously on all the major Hindu deities Shiva, Vishnu, Shakti, Ganesha, Surya, and Skanda. The Smarta tradition developed during the early, classical period of Hinduism around the beginning of the Common Era, when Hinduism emerged from the interaction between Brahmanism and local traditions. The Smarta tradition is aligned with Advaita Vedanta, and regards Adi Shankara as its founder or reformer, who considered worship of God with attributes as a journey towards ultimately realizing God without attributes The term Smartism is derived from Smriti texts of Hinduism, meaning those who remember the traditions in the texts. This Hindu sect practices a philosophical jnana yoga, scriptural studies, reflection, meditative path seeking an understanding of self's oneness with God. Scriptures The ancient scriptures of Hinduism are in Sanskrit. These texts are classified into two, Shruti and Smriti. Hindu scriptures were composed, memorized and transmitted verbally, across generations, for many centuries before they were written down. Over many centuries, sages refined the teachings and expanded the Shruti and Smriti, as well as developed shastras with epistemological and metaphysical theories of six classical schools of Hinduism. Shruti lit, that which is heard, primarily refers to the Vedas, which form the earliest record of the Hindu scriptures, and are regarded as eternal truths revealed to the ancient sages rishis. There are four Vedas, Rigveda, Samaveda, Yajurveda and Atharvaveda. Each Veda has been subclassified into four major text types, the Samhitas mantras and benedictions, the Aranyakas text on rituals, ceremonies, sacrifices and symbolic sacrifices, the Brahmanas commentaries on rituals, ceremonies and sacrifices, and the Upanishads text discussing meditation, philosophy and spiritual knowledge. The first two parts of the Vedas were subsequently called the Karmakanda ritualistic portion, while the last two form the Jnanakanda knowledge portion, discussing spiritual insight and philosophical teachings. The Upanishads are the foundation of Hindu philosophical thought and have profoundly influenced diverse traditions. Of the Shruti's Vedic corpus, they alone are widely influential among Hindus, considered scriptures par excellence of Hinduism, and their central ideas have continued to influence its thoughts and traditions. Sarvpali Radhakrishnan states that the Upanishads have played a dominating role ever since their appearance. There are 108 Muktika Upanishads in Hinduism, of which between 10 and 13 are variously counted by scholars as principal Upanishads, the most notable of the Smritis, remembered, are the Hindu epics and the Puranas. The epics consist of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. The Bhagavad Gita is an integral part of the Mahabharata and one of the most popular sacred texts of Hinduism. It is sometimes called Gitapanishad, then placed in the Shruti heard category, being Upanishadic in content. The Puranas, which started to be composed from c. 300 CE onward, contain extensive mythologies, and are central in the distribution of common themes of Hinduism through vivid narratives. The Yoga Sutras is a classical text for the Hindu yoga tradition, which gained a renewed popularity in the 20th century. Since the 19th century, Indian modernists have reasserted the Aryan origins of Hinduism, purifying Hinduism from its tantric elements and elevating the Vedic elements. Hindu modernists like Vivekananda see the Vedas as the laws of the spiritual world, which would still exist even if they were not revealed to the sages. In Tantric tradition, the Agamas refer to authoritative scriptures or the teachings of Shiva to Shakti, while Nagamas refers to the Vedas and the teachings of Shakti to Shiva. In Agamic schools of Hinduism, the Vedic literature and the Agamas are equally authoritative. Topic. Practices Topic. Rituals Most Hindus observe religious rituals at home. The rituals vary greatly among regions, villages, and individuals. 
They are not mandatory in Hinduism. The nature and place of rituals is an individual's choice. Some devout Hindus perform daily rituals such as worshipping at dawn after bathing usually at a family shrine, and typically includes lighting a lamp and offering foodstuffs before the images of deities, recitation from religious scripts, singing devotional hymns, yoga, meditation, chanting mantras and others. Vedic rituals of fire oblation yajna and chanting of Vedic hymns are observed on special occasions, such as a Hindu wedding. Other major life stage events, such as rituals after death, include the yajna and chanting of Vedic mantras. Topic. Life cycle rites of passage Major life stage milestones are celebrated as sanskara samskara, rites of passage in Hinduism. The rites of passage are not mandatory, and vary in details by gender, community and regionally. Gautama Dharmasutras composed in about the middle of 1st millennium BCE lists 48 sanskaras, while Grahasutra and other texts composed centuries later list between 12 and 16 sanskaras. The list of sanskaras in Hinduism include both external rituals such as those marking a baby's birth and a baby's name-giving ceremony, as well as inner rites of resolutions and ethics such as compassion towards all living beings and positive attitude. The major traditional rites of passage in Hinduism include garbhadana, pregnancy, pumsavana, right before the fetus begins moving and kicking in womb, samantanayana, parting of pregnant woman's hair, baby shower, jatakarman, right celebrating the newborn baby, namakarana, naming the child child, nishkramana baby's first outing from home into the world, anaprashana baby's first feeding of solid food, chudakarana baby's first haircut, tonsure, karnaveda ear piercing, vidyaramba baby's start with knowledge, upanayana entry into a school rite, kashanta and ritasuddhi first shave for boys, monarchy for girls, samavartana graduation ceremony, vivaha wedding, vratas fasting, spiritual studies and antyeshti cremation for an adult, burial for a child. In contemporary times, there is regional variation among Hindus as to which of these sanskaras are observed. In some cases, additional regional rites of passage such as sraddha ritual of feeding people after cremation are practiced. Topic: <laughs> Bhakti worship. Bhakti refers to devotion, participation in and the love of a personal god or a representational god by a devotee. Bhakti marga is considered in Hinduism as one of many possible paths of spirituality and alternative means to moksha. The other paths, left to the choice of a Hindu, are jnana marga path of knowledge, karma marga path of works, raja marga path of contemplation and meditation. Bhakti is practiced in a number of ways, ranging from reciting mantras, japas incantations, to individual private prayers within one's home shrine, or in a temple or near a river bank, sometimes in the presence of an idol or image of a deity. Hindu temples and domestic altars, states Lynn Fowlston, are important elements of worship in contemporary theistic Hinduism. While many visit a temple on a special occasion, most offer a brief prayer on an everyday basis at the domestic altar. This bhakti is expressed in a domestic shrine which typically is a dedicated part of the home and includes the images of deities or the gurus the Hindu chooses. Among Vaishnavism sub-traditions such as Swaminarayan, the home shrines can be elaborate with either a room dedicated to it or a dedicated part of the kitchen. The devotee uses this space for daily prayers or meditation, either before breakfast or after day's work. Bhakti is sometimes private inside household shrines and sometimes practiced as a community. It may include puja, arti, musical kirtan or singing bhajan, where devotional verses and hymns are read or poems are sung by a group of devotees. While the choice of the deity is at the discretion of the Hindu, the most observed traditions of Hindu devotionalism include Vaishnavism Vishnu, Shaivism Shiva, and Shaktism Shakti. A Hindu may worship multiple deities, all as henotheistic manifestations of the same ultimate reality, cosmic spirit and absolute spiritual concept called Brahman in Hinduism. Bhakti Marga, states Peshali, is more than ritual devotionalism, it includes practices and spiritual activities aimed at refining one's state of mind, knowing God, participating in God, and internalizing God. While bhakti practices are popular and easily observable aspect of Hinduism, not all Hindus practice bhakti, or believe in God with attributes Saguna Brahman. Concurrent Hindu practices include a belief in God without attributes, and God within oneself. <laughs> Festivals Hindu festivals Sanskrit, Utsava, literally, to lift higher 
are ceremonies that weave individual and social life to Dharma. Hinduism has many festivals throughout the year, where the dates are set by the lunisolar Hindu calendar, many coinciding with either the full moon Holi or the new moon Diwali, often with seasonal changes. Some festivals are found only regionally and they celebrate local traditions, while a few such as Holi and Diwali are pan-Hindu. The festivals typically celebrate events from Hinduism, connoting spiritual themes and celebrating aspects of human relationships such as the sister-brother bond over the Ruksha Bundan or Bhai Dooj festival. The same festival sometimes marks different stories depending on the Hindu denomination, and the celebrations incorporate regional themes, traditional agriculture, local arts, family get togethers, puja rituals, and feasts. Some major regional or pan Hindu festivals include <laughs> Pilgrimage Many adherents undertake pilgrimages, which have historically been an important part of Hinduism and remain so today. Pilgrimage sites are called Tirtha, Kshetra, Gopitha or Mahalaya. The process or journey associated with Tirtha is called Tirtha Yatra. According to the Hindu text Skanda Purana, Tirtha are of three kinds. Jangam Tirtha is to a place movable of a sadhu, a rishi, a guru. Stawar Tirtha is to a place immovable, like Benaras, Hardwar, Mount Kalash, holy rivers. While Manas Tirtha is to a place of mind of truth, charity, patience, compassion, soft speech, soul. Tirtha Yatra is, states Knut A. Jacobson, anything that has a salvific value to a Hindu, and includes pilgrimage sites such as mountains or forests or seashore or rivers or ponds, as well as virtues, actions, studies or state of mind. Pilgrimage sites of Hinduism are mentioned in the epic Mahabharata and the Puranas. Most Puranas include large sections on Tirtha Mahatmya along with tourist guides, which describe sacred sites and places to visit. In these texts, Varanasi, Benares, Kashi, Rameshwaram, Kanchipuram, Dwarka, Puri, Haridwar, Sri Rangam, Vrindavan, Ayodhya, Tirupati, Mayapur, Nathdwara, Twelve Jyotirlinga, and Shakti Pitha have been mentioned as particularly holy sites, along with geographies where major rivers meet Sangam or join the sea. Kumbhamela is another major pilgrimage on the eve of the solar festival Makar Sankranti. This pilgrimage rotates at a gap of three years among four sites, Allahabad at the confluence of the Ganges and Yamuna rivers, Hardwar near source of the Ganges, Ujjain on the Shipra River and Nasik on the bank of the Godavari River. This is one of world's largest mass pilgrimage, with an estimated 40 to 100 million people attending the event. At this event, they say a prayer to the sun and bathe in the river, a tradition attributed to Adi Shankara. Some pilgrimages are part of a vrata vow, which a Hindu may make for a number of reasons. It may mark a special occasion, such as the birth of a baby, or as part of a rite of passage such as a baby's first haircut, or after healing from a sickness. It may, states Ek, also be the result of prayers answered. An alternative reason for Tirtha, for some Hindus, is to respect wishes or in memory of a beloved person after his or her death. This may include dispersing their cremation ashes in a Tirtha region in a stream, river or sea to honor the wishes of the dead. The journey to a Tirtha, assert some Hindu texts, helps one overcome the sorrow of the loss. Other reasons for a Tirtha in Hinduism is to rejuvenate or gain spiritual merit by traveling to famed temples or bathe in rivers such as the Ganges. Tirtha has been one of the recommended means of addressing remorse and to perform penance, for unintentional errors and intentional sins, in the Hindu tradition. The proper procedure for a pilgrimage is widely discussed in Hindu texts. The most accepted view is that the greatest austerity comes from traveling on foot, or part of the journey is on foot, and that the use of a conveyance is only acceptable if the pilgrimage is otherwise impossible. <laughs> Person and society <laughs> Varnas Hindu society has been categorized into four classes, called Varnas. They are the Brahmins, Vedic teachers and priests, the Kshatriyas, warriors and kings, the Vaishyas, farmers and merchants, and the Shudras, servants and laborers. The Bhagavad Gita links the Varna to an individual's duty, svadharma, inborn nature, svabhava, and natural tendencies. Guna. The Manumriti categorizes the different castes. Some mobility and flexibility within the Varnas challenge allegations of social discrimination in the caste system, as has been pointed out by several sociologists, although some other scholars disagree. Scholars debate whether the so called caste system is part of Hinduism sanctioned by the scriptures or social custom. 
and various contemporary scholars have argued that the caste system was constructed by the British colonial regime. A renunciant man of knowledge is usually called Varnatita or beyond all Varnas in Vedantic works. The Bisu is advised to not bother about the caste of the family from which he begs his food. Scholars like Adi Sankara affirm that not only is Brahman beyond all Varnas, the man who is identified with him also transcends the distinctions and limitations of caste. Yoga In whatever way a Hindu defines the goal of life, there are several methods yogas that sages have taught for reaching that goal. Yoga is a Hindu discipline which trains the body, mind and consciousness for health, tranquility and spiritual insight. This is done through a system of postures and exercises to practice control of the body and mind. Texts dedicated to yoga include the Yoga Sutras, the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, the Bhagavad Gita and, as their philosophical and historical basis, the Upanishads. Yoga is means, and the four major marga paths discussed in Hinduism are, Bhakti Yoga the path of love and devotion, Karma Yoga the path of right action, Raja Yoga the path of meditation, Jnana Yoga the path of wisdom. An individual may prefer one or some yogas over others, according to his or her inclination and understanding. Practice of one yoga does not exclude others. Topic. Symbolism Hinduism has a developed system of symbolism and iconography to represent the sacred in art, architecture, literature and worship. These symbols gain their meaning from the scriptures or cultural traditions. The syllable Om which represents the Brahman and Atman has grown to represent Hinduism itself, while other markings such as the swastika sign represent auspiciousness, and tilaka literally, seed on forehead, considered to be the location of spiritual third eye, marks ceremonious welcome, blessing or one's participation in a ritual or rite of passage. Elaborate tilaka with lines may also identify a devotee of a particular denomination. Flowers, birds, animals, instruments, symmetric mandala drawings, objects, idols are all part of symbolic iconography in Hinduism. <laughs> Ahimsa, vegetarianism and other food customs Hindus advocate the practice of ahimsa non-violence and respect for all life because divinity is believed to permeate all beings, including plants and non-human animals. The term Ahimsa appears in the Upanishads. The epic Mahabharata and Ahimsa is the first of the five yamas vows of self -restraint in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. In accordance with Ahimsa, many Hindus embrace vegetarianism to respect higher forms of life. Estimates of strict lacto-vegetarians in India includes adherents of all religions who never eat any meat, fish or eggs vary between 20% and 42%, while others are either less strict vegetarians or non-vegetarians. Those who eat meat seek jatka quick death method of meat production, and dislike halal slow blood death method, believing that quick death method reduces suffering to the animal. The food habits vary with region, with Bengali Hindus and Hindus living in Himalayan regions, or river delta regions, regularly eating meat and fish. Some avoid meat on specific festivals or occasions. Observant Hindus who do eat meat almost always abstain from beef. The cow in Hindu society is traditionally identified as a caretaker and a maternal figure, and Hindu society honors the cow as a symbol of unselfish giving. There are many Hindu groups that have continued to abide by a strict vegetarian diet in modern times. Some adhere to a diet that is devoid of meat, eggs, and seafood. Food affects body, mind, and spirit in Hindu beliefs. Hindu texts such as Sandilya Upanishad and Svatmarama recommend mitahara eating in moderation as one of the yamas virtuous self -restraints. The Bhagavad Gita links body and mind to food one consumes in verses 17.8 through 17.10. Some Hindus such as those belonging to the Shaktism tradition, and Hindus in regions such as Bali and Nepal practice animal sacrifice. The sacrificed animal is eaten as ritual food. In contrast, the Vaishnava Hindus abhor and vigorously oppose animal sacrifice. The principle of non-violence to animals has been so thoroughly adopted in Hinduism that animal sacrifice is uncommon and historically reduced to a vestigial marginal practice. <laughs> <laughs> Institutions <laughs> Temple A Hindu temple is a house of gods. 
It is a space and structure designed to bring human beings and gods together, infused with symbolism to express the ideas and beliefs of Hinduism. A temple incorporates all elements of Hindu cosmology, the highest spire or dome representing Mount Meru, reminder of the abode of Brahma and the center of spiritual universe, the carvings and iconography symbolically presenting Dharma, Kama, Artha, Moksha and Karma. The layout, the motifs, the plan and the building process recite ancient rituals, geometric symbolisms, and reflect beliefs and values innate within various schools of Hinduism. Hindu temples are spiritual destinations for many Hindus not all, as well as landmarks for arts, annual festivals, rite of passage rituals, and community celebrations. Hindu temples come in many styles, diverse locations, deploy different construction methods and are adapted to different deities and regional beliefs. Two major styles of Hindu temples include the Gopuram style found in South India, and Nagara style found in North India. Other styles include cave, forest and mountain temples. Yet, despite their differences, almost all Hindu temples share certain common architectural principles, core ideas, symbolism and themes. Many temples feature one or more idols murtis. The idol and grabgriya in the Brahma Pada the center of the temple, under the main spire, serves as a focal point darsana, a site in a Hindu temple. In larger temples, the central space typically is surrounded by an ambulatory for the devotee to walk around and ritually circumambulate the purusa Brahman, the universal essence. Ashrama Traditionally the life of a Hindu is divided into four asramas phases or life stages, another meaning includes monastery. The four ashramas are brahmacharya student grihastha householder vanaprastha retired and sannyasa renunciation brahmacharya represents the bachelor student stage of life grihastha refers to the individual's married life with the duties of maintaining a household raising a family educating one's children and leading a family centered and a dharmic social life Grihastha stage starts with Hindu wedding, and has been considered as the most important of all stages in sociological context, as Hindus in this stage not only pursued a virtuous life, they produced food and wealth that sustained people in other stages of life, as well as the offsprings that continued mankind. Vanaprastha is the retirement stage, where a person hands over household responsibilities to the next generation, took an advisory role, and gradually withdrew from the world. The sannyasa stage marks renunciation and a state of disinterest and detachment from material life, generally without any meaningful property or home ascetic state, and focused on moksha, peace and simple spiritual life. The ashramas system has been one facet of the dharma concept in Hinduism. Combined with four proper goals of human life, purasartha, the ashramas system traditionally aimed at providing a Hindu with fulfilling life and spiritual liberation. While these stages are typically sequential, any person can enter sannyasa ascetic stage and become an ascetic at any time after the brahmacharya stage. Sannyasa is not religiously mandatory in Hinduism, and elderly people are free to live with their families. Monasticism Some Hindus choose to live a monastic life sannyasa in pursuit of liberation moksha or another form of spiritual perfection. Monastics commit themselves to a simple and celibate life, detached from material pursuits, of meditation and spiritual contemplation. A Hindu monk is called a sannyasi, sadhu, or swami. A female renunciate is called a sannyasini. Renunciates receive high respect in Hindu society because of their simple ahimsa-driven lifestyle and dedication to spiritual liberation moksha believed to be the ultimate goal of life in Hinduism. Some monastics live in monasteries, while others wander from place to place, depending on donated food and charity for their needs. History Periodization. James Mill (1773–1836), in his *The History of British India* (1817), distinguished three phases in the history of India, namely Hindu, Muslim, and British civilizations. This periodization has been criticized for the misconceptions it has given rise to. Another periodization is the division into ancient, classical, medieval, and modern periods. An elaborate periodization may be as follows. Pravedic religions pre-history and Indus Valley civilization, until c. 1500 BCE 
Vedic period c. 1500 to 500 BCE. Second urbanization c. 500 to 200 BCE. Classical Hinduism c. 200 BCE to 1100 CE, Pre-Classical Hinduism c. 200 BCE to 300 CE. Golden Age Gupta Empire c. 320 to 650 CE. Late Classical Hinduism, Puranic Hinduism c. 650-1100 CE, Islam and Sects of Hinduism c. 1200 to 1700 CE. Modern Hinduism from c. 1800. Topic. Origins Hinduism is a fusion or synthesis of various Indian cultures and traditions. Among the roots of Hinduism are the historical Vedic religion of Iron Age India, itself already the product of a composite of the Indo-Aryan and Harappan cultures and civilizations, but also the Sramana or renouncer traditions of Northeast India, and Mesolithic and Neolithic cultures of India, such as the religions of the Indus Valley Civilization, Dravidian traditions, and the local traditions and tribal religions. This Hindu synthesis emerged after the Vedic period, between 500 to 200 BCE and c. 300 CE, the beginning of the epic and Puranic c. Q. Preclassical period, and incorporated Shramanic and Buddhist influences and the emerging Bhakti tradition into the Brahmanical fold via the Smriti literature. From northern India, this Hindu synthesis and its societal divisions, spread to southern India and parts of Southeast Asia. Pravedic religions until c. 1500 BCE. The earliest prehistoric religion in India that may have left its traces in Hinduism comes from Mesolithic as observed in the sites such as the rock paintings of Bimbetka rock shelters dating to a period of 30,000 BCE or older, as well as Neolithic times. Some of the religious practices can be considered to have originated in 4000 BCE. Several tribal religions still exist, though their practices may not resemble those of prehistoric religions. According to anthropologist Possel, the Indus Valley civilization provides a logical, if somewhat arbitrary, starting point for some aspects of the later Hindu tradition. The religion of this period included worship of a great male god, which is compared to a proto Shiva, and probably a mother goddess, that may prefigure Shakti. However these links of deities and practices of the Indus religion to later day Hinduism are subject to both political contention and scholarly dispute. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Vedic period C 1500 to 500 BCE. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Origins and development. The Vedic period named after the Vedic religion of the Indo-Aryans lasted from C 1500 to 500 BCE. The Indo-Aryans were pastoralists who migrated into northwestern India after the collapse of the Indus Valley Civilization. During the early Vedic period, c. 1500 to 1100 BCE, Vedic tribes were pastoralists, wandering around in northwest India. After 1100 BCE, the Vedic tribes moved into the western Ganges plain, adapting an agrarical lifestyle. Rudimentary state forms appeared, of which the Kuru Pankala Union was the most influential. It was a tribal union, which developed into the first recorded state level society in South Asia around 1000 BCE. This, according to Witzel, decisively changed the Vedic heritage of the early Vedic period, collecting the Vedic hymns into collections, and shifting ritual exchange within a tribe to social exchange within the larger Kuru realm through complicated srauta rituals. In this period, states Samuel, emerged the Brahmana and Aranyaka layers of Vedic texts, which merged into the earliest Upanishads. These texts began to ask the meaning of a ritual, adding increasing levels of philosophical and metaphysical speculation, or Hindu synthesis. <inaudible> <inaudible> Vedic religion The Indo-Aryans brought with them their language and religion. The Vedic beliefs and practices of the pre-classical era were closely related to the hypothesized Proto-Indo-European religion, and the Indo-Iranian religion. The Vedic religion history is unclear and heavily contested, states Samuel. In the later Vedic period, it co-existed with local religions, such as the mother goddess worshipping Yaksha cults. 
The Vedic was itself likely the product of a composite of the Indo Aryan and Harappan cultures and civilizations. David Gordon White cites three other mainstream scholars who have emphatically demonstrated that Vedic religion is partially derived from the Indus Valley civilizations. Their religion was further developed when they migrated into the Ganges plain after c. 1100 BCE and became settled farmers, further syncretizing with the native cultures of northern India. The composition of the Vedic literature began in the second millennium BCE. The oldest of these Vedic texts is the Rigveda, composed between c. 1500 to 1200 BCE, though a wider approximation of c. 1700 to 1100 BCE has also been given. The first half of the first millennium BCE was a period of great intellectual and social cultural ferment in ancient India. New ideas developed both in the Vedic tradition in the form of the Upanishads, and outside of the Vedic tradition through the Sramana movements. For example, prior to the birth of the Buddha and the Mahavira, and related Sramana movements, the Brahmanical tradition had questioned the meaning and efficacy of Vedic rituals, then internalized and variously reinterpreted the Vedic fire rituals as ethical concepts such as truth, right, tranquility or restraint. The 9th and 8th centuries BCE witnessed the composition of the earliest Upanishads with such ideas. Other ancient principal Upanishads were composed in the centuries that followed, forming the foundation of classical Hinduism and the Vedanta conclusion of the Veda literature. Topic: <laughs> Second Urbanization, c. 500 to 200 BCE. Increasing urbanization of India between 800 and 400 BCE, and possibly the spread of urban diseases, contributed to the rise of ascetic movements and of new ideas which challenged the orthodox Brahmanism. These ideas led to Sramana movements, of which Mahavira c. 549-477 BCE, proponent of Jainism, and Buddha c. 563-483, founder of Buddhism, were the most prominent icons. According to Bronckhorst, the Sramana culture arose in Greater Magadha, which was Indo-European, but not Vedic. In this culture, Kshatriyas were placed higher than Brahmins, and it rejected Vedic authority and rituals. Geoffrey Samuel, following Tom Hopkins, also argues that the Gangetic Plain, which gave rise to Jainism and Buddhism, incorporated a culture which was different from the Brahmanical orthodoxy practiced in the Kuru Pankala region. The ascetic tradition of Vedic period in part created the foundational theories of samsara and of moksha, liberation from samsara, which became characteristic for Hinduism, along with Buddhism and Jainism. These ascetic concepts were adopted by schools of Hinduism as well as other major Indian religions, but key differences between their premises defined their further development. Hinduism, for example, developed its ideas with the premise that every human being has a soul atman, self, while Buddhism developed with the premise that there is no soul or self. The chronology of these religious concepts is unclear, and scholars contest which religion affected the other as well as the chronological sequence of the ancient texts. Pratt notes that Oldenburg 1854 Newman 1865 and Radhakrishnan 1888 believed that the Buddhist canon had been influenced by Upanishads, while La Vallee Poussin thinks the influence was Nile, and Eliot and several others insist that on some points such as the existence of soul or self the Buddha was directly antithetical to the Upanishads. Topic. Classical Hinduism c. 200 BCE to 1100 CE. From about 500 BCE through about 300 CE, the Vedic Brahmanic synthesis or Hindu synthesis continued. Classical Hindu and Shramanic particularly Buddhist ideas spread within Indian subcontinent, as well outside India such as in Central Asia, and the parts of Southeast Asia coasts of Indonesia and peninsular Thailand. Pre-classical Hinduism c. 200 BCE to 300 CE the Hindu synthesis or Brahmanical synthesis incorporated Shramanic and Buddhist influences into the Brahmanical fold via the Smriti remembered literature. According to Imbri, several other religious traditions had existed side by side with the Vedic religion. These indigenous religions eventually found a place under the broad mantle of the Vedic religion." The Smriti texts of the period between 200 BCE–100 CE affirmed the authority of the Vedas. 
The acceptance of the ideas in the Vedas and Upanishads became a central criterion for defining Hinduism, while the heterodox movements rejected those ideas. The major Sanskrit epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata, which belong to the Smriti, were compiled over a protracted period during the late centuries BCE and the early centuries CE. These are legendary dialogues interspersed with philosophical treatises. The Bhagavad Gita was composed in this period and consolidated diverse philosophies and soteriological ideas. During this period, the foundational texts of several schools of Hindu philosophy were formally written down, including Samkhya, Yoga, Naya, Vaisheshika, Purva Mimamsa, and Vedanta. The Smriti literature of Hinduism, particularly the sutras, as well as other Hindu texts such as the Arthashastra and Sushruta Samhita, were also written or expanded during this period. Many influential Yoga Upanishads, states Gavin Flood, were composed before the 3rd century CE. Seven Sannyasa Upanishads of Hinduism were composed between the last centuries of the 1st millennium BCE and before the 3rd century CE. All these texts describe Hindu renunciation and monastic values, and express strongly Advaita Vedanta tradition ideas. This, state Patrick Olivelle and other scholars, is likely because the monasteries of Advaita tradition of Hinduism had become well established in ancient times. The first version of Natyasastra, a Hindu text on performance arts that integrates Vedic ideology, was also completed before the 2nd century CE. Golden Age Gupta Empire c. 320-650 CE During the Gupta period, the first stone and cave Hindu temples dedicated to Hindu deities were built, some of which have survived into the modern era. Numerous monasteries and universities were also built during the Gupta dynasty era, which supported Vedic and non-Vedic studies, including the famed Nalanda, the first version of early Puranas, likely composed between 250 and 500 CE, show continuities with the Vedic religion, but also an expanded mythology of Vishnu, Shiva and Devi goddess. The Puranas were living texts that were revised over time, and Lorenzen suggests these texts may reflect the beginnings of medieval Hinduism. Late Classical Hinduism, Puranic Hinduism c. CE After the end of the Gupta Empire, power became decentralized in India. The disintegration of central power also led to regionalization of religiosity, and religious rivalry. Rural and devotional movements arose within Hinduism, along with Shaivism, Vaisnavism, Bhakti and Tantra, that competed with each other, as well as with numerous sects of Buddhism and Jainism. Buddhism declined, though many of its ideas, and even the Buddha himself, were absorbed into certain Brahmanical traditions. Srauta rituals declined in India and were replaced with Buddhist and Hindu initiatory rituals for royal courts. Over time, some Buddhist practices were integrated into Hinduism. Monumental Hindu temples were built in South Asia and Southeast Asia, while Vajrayana Buddhism literature developed as a result of royal courts sponsoring both Buddhism and Savism. The first edition of many Puranas were composed in this period. Examples include Bhagavata Purana and Vishnu Purana with legends of Krishna, while Padma Purana and Kirma Purana expressed reverence for Vishnu, Shiva and Shakti with equal enthusiasm, all of them included topics such as yoga practice and pilgrimage tour guides to Hindu holy sites. Early colonial era orientalists proposed that the Puranas were religious texts of medieval Hinduism. However, modern era scholars, such as Ors App, Ronald Inden and Ludo Rocher state that this is highly misleading because these texts were continuously revised, exist in numerous very different versions and are too inconsistent to be religious texts. Bhakti ideas centered around loving devotion to Vishnu and Shiva with songs and music, were pioneered in this period by the Alvars and Nayanars of South India. Major Hinduism scholars of this period included Adi Shankara, Mandana Misra, Padmapada and Shursvara of the Advaita schools, Sabara, Vatsyayana and Samkarasvaman of Naya Vaisesika schools, Mathara and Yuktidipika author unknown of Samkhya Yoga, Bhartarhari, Vasugupta and Abhinavagupta of Kashmir Shaivism, and Ramanuja of Vishishtadvaita school of Hinduism Shri Vaishnavism. Islamic rule and bhakti movement of Hinduism c. 1200-1750 CE The Islamic rule period witnessed Hindu-Muslim confrontation and violence, but, "...violence did not normally characterize the relations of Muslim and Hindu." Enslavement of non-Muslims, especially Hindus in India, was part of the Muslim raids and conquests. 
after the 14th century slavery became less common and in 1562, Akbar abolished the practice of enslaving the families of war captives. Akbar recognized Hinduism, protected Hindu temples, and abolished jizya head taxes against Hindus. Occasionally, Muslim rulers of the Delhi Sultanate and the Mughal Empire, before and after Akbar, from the 12th century to the 18th century, destroyed Hindu temples, and persecuted non-Muslims. Though Islam came to Indian subcontinent in the early 7th century with the advent of Arab traders, it started impacting Indian religions after the 10th century, and particularly after the 12th century with the establishment and then expansion of Islamic rule. During this period Buddhism declined rapidly, and a distinct Indo-Islamic culture emerged. Under Akbar an intriguing blend of Perso-Islamic and Rajput Hindu traditions became manifest. Nevertheless, many orthodox ulamas, learned Islamic jurists, opposed the rapprochement of Hinduism and Islam, and the two merely co-existed, although there was more accommodation at the peasantry level of Indian society. According to Hardy, the Muslim rulers were not concerned with the number of converts, since the stability and continuity of their regime did not depend on the number of Muslims. In general, religious conversion was a gradual process, with some converts attracted to pious Muslim saints, while others converted to Islam to gain tax relief, land grant, marriage partners, social and economic advancement, or freedom from slavery. In border regions such as the Punjab and eastern Bengal, the share of Muslims grew as large as 70% to 90% of the population, whereas in the heartland of Muslim rule, the upper Gangetic Plain, the Muslims constituted only 10 to 15% of the population. Between the 14th and 18th century, Hinduism was revived in certain provinces of India under two powerful states, viz. Vijayanagar and Maratha. In the 14th and 15th centuries southern India saw the rise of the Hindu Vijayanagar Empire, which served as a barrier against invasion by the Muslim sultanates of the north, and it fostered the reconstruction of Hindu life and administration. Vidyaranya, also known as Madhava, who was the twelfth Jagadguru of the Sringeri Sarada Pitham from 1380-6, and a minister in the Vijayanagara Empire, helped establish Shankara as a rallying symbol of values, and helped spread historical and cultural influence of Shankara's Vedanta philosophies. The Hindu Maratha Confederacy rose to power in the 18th century and ended up overthrowing Muslim power in India. Hinduism underwent profound changes, aided in part by teachers such as Ramanuja, Madhva, and Chaitanya. Tantra disappeared in northern India, partly due to Muslim rule, while the Bhakti movement grew, with followers engaging in emotional, passionate, and community oriented devotional worship, participating in Saguna or Nirguna Brahman ideologies. According to Nicholson, already between the 12th and the 16th century, "...certain thinkers began to treat as a single whole the diverse philosophical teachings of the Upanishads, epics, Puranas, and the schools known retrospectively as the six systems of mainstream Hindu philosophy." Michaels notes that a historicization emerged which preceded later nationalism, articulating ideas which glorified Hinduism and the past. Topic. Modern Hinduism from circa 1800. Topic. Hindu revivalism With the onset of the British Raj, the colonization of India by the British, there also started a Hindu renaissance in the 19th century, which profoundly changed the understanding of Hinduism in both India and the West. Indology as an academic discipline of studying Indian culture from a European perspective was established in the 19th century, led by scholars such as Max Muller and John Woodruff. They brought Vedic, Puranic and Tantric literature and philosophy to Europe and the United States. Western Orientalists searched for the essence of the Indian religions, discerning this in the Vedas, and meanwhile creating the notion of Hinduism. As a unified body of religious praxis and the popular picture of mystical India. This idea of a Vedic essence was taken over by Hindu reform movements as the Brahmo Samaj, which was supported for a while by the Unitarian Church, together with the ideas of universalism and perennialism, the idea that all religions share a common mystic ground. This Hindu modernism, with proponents like Vivekananda, Aurobindo, and Radhakrishnan, became central in the popular understanding of Hinduism. Topic. Popularity in the West Influential 20th-century Hindus were Ramana Maharshi, B.K.S. 
Iyengar, Paramahansa Yogananda, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, Prabhupada, founder of Iskan, Sri Chinmoy, Swami Rama, and others who translated, reformulated, and presented Hinduism's foundational texts for contemporary audiences in new iterations, raising the profiles of yoga and Vedanta in the West and attracting followers and attention in India and abroad. Hindu practices such as yoga, Ayurvedic health, tantric sexuality through Neotantra and the Kama Sutra have spread beyond Hindu communities and have been accepted by several non-Hindus. Hinduism is attracting Western adherents through the affiliated practice of yoga. Yoga centers in the West—which generally advocate vegetarianism— Attract young, well-educated Westerners who are drawn by yoga's benefits for the physical and emotional health, there they are introduced to the Hindu philosophical system taught by most yoga teachers, known as Vedanta. It is estimated that around 30 million Americans and 5 million Europeans regularly practice some form of Hatha Yoga. In Australia, the number of practitioners is about 300,000. In New Zealand the number is also around 300,000. Hindutva In the 20th century, Hinduism also gained prominence as a political force and a source for national identity in India. With origins traced back to the establishment of the Hindu Mahasabha in the 1910s, the movement grew with the formulation and development of the Hindutva ideology in the following decades, the establishment of Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh in 1925, and the entry, and later success, of RSS offshoots Jana Sangha and Bharatiya Janata Party in electoral politics in post-independence India. Hindu religiosity plays an important role in the nationalist movement. Topic. Demographics Hinduism is a major religion in India. Hinduism was followed by around 79.8% of the country's population of 1.21 billion 2011 census 960 million adherents. Other significant populations are found in Nepal 23 million, Bangladesh 15 million, and the Indonesian island of Bali 3.9 million. The majority of the Vietnamese Cham people also follow Hinduism, with the largest proportion in Ninh Thuan province, countries with the greatest proportion of Hindus Nepal 81.3% India 79.8% Mauritius 48.5% Guyana 28.4% Fiji 27.9% Bhutan 22.6% Suriname 22.3% Trinidad and Tobago 18.2% Qatar 13.8% Sri Lanka 12.6% Bahrain 9.8% Bangladesh 8.5% Réunion 6.7% United Arab Emirates 6.6% Malaysia 6.3% Kuwait 6% Oman 5.5% Singapore 5% Seychelles 2.4% Belize 2% Demographically, Hinduism is the world's third largest religion, after Christianity and Islam. Topic. Conversion debate In the modern era, religious conversion from and to Hinduism has been a controversial subject. Some state the concept of missionary conversion, either way, is anathema to the precepts of Hinduism. Religious conversion to Hinduism has a long history outside India. Merchants and traders of India, particularly from the Indian peninsula, carried their religious ideas, which led to religious conversions to Hinduism in Southeast Asia. Within India, archaeological and textual evidence such as the 2nd century BCE Heliodorus Pillar suggest that Greeks and other foreigners converted to Hinduism. The debate on proselytization and religious conversion between Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism is more recent, and started in the 19th century. Religious leaders of some Hindu reform movements, such as the Arya Samaj, launched Shuddhi movement to proselytize and reconvert Muslims and Christians back to Hinduism, while those such as the Brahmo Samaj suggested Hinduism to be a non missionary religion. All these sects of Hinduism have welcomed new members to their group, while other leaders of Hinduism's diverse schools have stated that given the intensive proselytization activities from missionary Islam and Christianity, this, there is no such thing as proselytism in Hinduism, view must be re-examined. 
the appropriateness of conversion from major religions to Hinduism, and vice versa, has been and remains an actively debated topic in India, and in Indonesia. See also Hinduism Related systems and religions Notes Subnotes References Sources Printed sources Web sources Further reading Introductory Fowler, Janine D. Hinduism, Beliefs and Practices. Sussex Academic Press. ISBN 978-1-898723-60-8. Flood, Gavin D. An Introduction to Hinduism, Cambridge University Pressregans Parpola, Asko The Roots of Hinduism. The Early Aryans and the Indus Civilization, Oxford University Press. Samuel, Jeffrey 2010, The Origins of Yoga and Tantra. Indic Religions to the 13th Century, Cambridge University Press Texts Klostermeyer, Klaus K. 2007. A Survey of Hinduism, 3rd Edition. State University of New York Press. ISBN 9780791470108. Flood, Flood, Gavin ed. Blackwell Companion to Hinduism. Blackwell Publishing. ISBN 0-631-21535-2, CS1 maint, Extra Text, Authors List link. Richards, Glynn, ed. 1985. A Sourcebook of Modern Hinduism. London, Curzon Press, X, 212p. ISBN 0-7007-0173-7 External links Hinduism. Encyclopædia Britannica Online. Hindu Philosophy and Hinduism, IEP, Shyam Ranganathan, York University, Vedic Hinduism S. W. Jameson and M. Witzel, Harvard University The Hindu Religion, Swami Vivekananda 1894, Wikisource Hinduism by Swami Nikilananda, The Ramakrishna Mission one of the theistic Hindu movements All About Hinduism by Swami Sivananda PDF, The Divine Life Society one of the theistic Hindu movements Advaita Vedanta Hinduism by Sangeetha Menon, IEP one of the non-theistic school of Hindu philosophy Heart of Hinduism, an overview of Hindu traditions, Iskand Hare Krishna movement. What is Hinduism? Editors of Hinduism Today magazine Hinduism Outside India, a bibliography, Harvard University The Pluralism Project What's in a name? Agama Hindu Bali in the Making, Hinduism in Bali, Indonesia Michel Picard, Le CNRS Paris, France Research on Hinduism The Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies, University of Oxford Latest issue of the Journal of Hindu Studies, Oxford University Press Latest issue of the International Journal of Hindu Studies, Springer Latest issue of the Journal of Hindu Christian Studies, Butler University Latest issue of the Journal of Indo-Judaic Studies, Florida International University Latest issue of the International Journal of Dharma Studies, Springer Topical publications on Hinduism, other Indic religions Audio on Hinduism Hinduism as a Religion, by Swami Vivekananda, World Parliament of Religion, Chicago in 1893 audio version, text. Scholarly Lectures on Hinduism, Ox, University of Oxford.